see here. It's on? All right. All right. Good evening, everybody. God is good. Amen. Thank the Lord for that good song. Amen. Uh, it's, it's, it's an odd thing when you've preached for 25 years that Jesus is coming and you try to convince people that it could be tonight and then all of a sudden uh, you, you find your own faith just tested and everything because when all this corona deal came down, I don't think any of us really thought that they could take over and force people to do things just as fast as they did. And it was all over the whole world at one time. And even guys like us have preached it for 25 years. Uh, I stood back and said, man, I believed it, but I don't know if I really believed it. Like it could really happen in our lifetime. I mean, that's how close we are. Um, you know, like the things I said, uh, maybe I was trying to convince myself as much as everybody else to believe it. I don't know, but man, is it real. Uh, then when the Michigan governor said seeds are off limits, I mean, I've preached that for years. We wonder how Antichrist is going to control the food when you have to have a mark to buy or sell. And uh, we know that Monsanto has had control of seeds and they're genetically modifying and patenting them and they own the seeds of the world. And uh, so there's just a lot that's happened. That song is just so pertinent tonight. Amen. I think I really believe it more today than I've ever believed it before, that Jesus could come at any moment. Amen. And uh, it's, it's a little scary, uh, but you know, for those of us that are saved by the grace of God, we have nothing to fear. Amen. Uh, people have, I, I think I irritate people. I'm so non-fearful about the coronavirus. I don't know. I just... Uh, <laughs> I'm trying not to be ornery about it, but I mean, there's perfectly healthy people in their 20s that are kind of huddled down in their homes and haven't left for months, and I'm just sitting there saying, what in the world has happened, man? Uh, at some point, I mean, you got to go out and live your life and do right. So anyway, enough about that. All right. A lot of things I've been asked to do tonight, amen? And so uh, he's asked me to do a miracle. First of all, preach in under an hour and then add everything else on top of it. Let me just say, I, I really, it's a blessing to see some of you folks I've known for years, and uh, it's a blessing to see others that I haven't uh, got to meet yet, but uh, it, it's just great to see what God's doing here. Preacher's been sharing some things, and I count your pastor a dear friend. We don't talk as much as we should, but uh, he knows I'm steeped in busyness, and he is probably one of the busiest people I know that runs, he makes me mad because he has so much energy, amen. I can't wait till he hits 50 and starts slowing down and stuff, and I just be like, I told you it was going to happen. He's like the Energizer Bunny, amen. He's got so many irons in the fire, but you got a man uh, at the helm here that God has put here, I believe, that really uh, wants to serve the Lord. It's neat to see with things that God's doing. I was uh, going to try to come early, but worked out better for me to stay tonight for a while. We're going to run around, and he's going to try to show me stuff that God's doing in the church building, and all of that. I told him he had to have it done by the time I got here. Apparently, he didn't listen. Amen. But uh, I'm excited about seeing everything that the Lord is doing. God is certainly at work. Amen. And I appreciate his goodness. Uh, I don't. I, I was going to put some of my tracks out. I have just a few of them with me uh, from the Grateful Dead to Gratefully Alive. I think I've got more in this container up here. But uh, I was a Grateful Deadhead, and God gloriously saved me out of a life of drugs and a life of uh, jail. I met several jailers and uh, I know what it's like to see my mama weeping through the jail bars when I wake up out of a drunken stupor fighting the cops and throwing a fit at the hospital, wanting to take a blood test and just things like that. And uh, seeing mama weeping through the bars saying, when are you ever going to get right? When are you ever going to get saved? You know, and things like that. But I'm glad tonight that I'm saved. Amen. And uh, so I know, where, I know where some of you guys have come from. Some of you guys are facing some issues in your life. Uh, let me tell you what, you give your life to the Lord more and more, and God will do miraculous things with you, amen? I just never would have dreamed God would be able to get any use out of my worthless life, amen? But I'm so thankful that he has. He's a good God, and he loves us and cares for us. Um, <clears throat> a lot of things I was supposed to do now. Let me just try to do this real quickly. Uh, on the books, um, here's what I'm going to do, preacher. I'm going to try to, uh, realizing that, and I'm not sure who would be even interested or not, but I, this is going to sound really kind of stupid, but I actually have to pay for these books, amen. Uh, I've been in churches where people help themselves, and then I have to actually pay the bills, amen. But uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take 25% off of everything that I have in here. Like, for example, the American Foundations book, if you just want a great, simple read, uh, it's about 115 pages. It tells you the history of America and how it became great through the influence of Baptist churches. That's normally $8. I'll sell that for $6 tonight. Um, and then 
the Waldensian book, that one is uh, $12, and uh, I'll just sell that for 8 tonight, so that'd be 33% off or a third off of that one. And so I'll just, uh, I'll try to do that for everything that I have, and uh, there are several other books. I do have the final booklet of the series done, and so I do have some of those sets of booklets like these right here, and uh, let's see if I can find one. Here's a set. This is all 10 booklets. And uh, this is normally $40. I'll just sell that for like maybe $32 because I think I'll probably still lose. I'll lose money on that, but I'll do that if somebody's interested in that. And I really didn't come to sell books, but he said to mention something about it. So I do want to try to be a blessing to you if I can. And so if you're ever wanting to buy books and maybe give some away even as a present for a birthday or Christmas, now would probably be the time to buy them, amen, because <laughs> the sale's over as soon as I leave here tonight, amen. Uh, but anyway, I have about a $1,500 book that I need to pay off, so I'm trying to sell some books, amen. But uh, that being said, I didn't come for that, amen. Uh, and uh, I was telling your preacher, I've done so many Baptist history tours, it's so weird this year because we didn't have a spring tour, and I'm driving by cemeteries, and it's like, man. There's like this weird drawing to go walk around a cemetery with a bunch of fat Baptist preachers, you know, a chicken, you know, still on their face from the restaurant, and just go lecture on some dead guy that did something for God, amen? I mean, honestly, it's just, it's really weird. Uh, I almost drove down to Lewis Craig's grave the other day. It's like, man, it's like 65, it's breezy. I'm like, I should be in a field somewhere, tears streaming down my face, amen, with somebody preaching, uh, standing around a graveside, amen? And so, uh, it's just been really weird, uh, different year this year, but... Uh, we are planning on doing a, a European tour next year if God allows us. If not, we're going to try to move it. Uh, the travel right now is really weird. I've got friends, like my daughter married into Brother Rocky Fritz's church there in Illinois. His son, uh, they're in uh, Cape Verde, which is an island off of the western uh, part of Africa. And they were going to come home three months ago. They're stuck. They're literally like locked down. They can't even get to the mainland of Africa to try to find a flight. And uh, so a lot, lot, lot of stuff like that's going on. So I'm not sure how all that's going to work out, but do pray for the society. Uh, we just did give a $1,250 offering uh, to the particular Baptist Press uh, in the, as an honorarium uh, for uh, Brother Terry Wooliver. Brother Terry Wooliver was a premier historian and uh, wrote so much that we've all benefited and gleaned from. And uh, so we wanted to try to do something just in his memory to be a blessing to the press. I want to see it go on. He has about 900 pages. Uh, we've benefited from uh, other guys uh, Morgan Edwards had an unpublished uh, biography and different ones like that. And he has 900 pages of Baptist history. That he, was gonna, he was writing a book, and he died with 900 pages uh, on a file. And they're going to try to maybe publish that down the road. And so we'd like to also be a, uh, try to be a part of that. But uh, I don't want to get into all the extra peripheral ministries I've got, amen. But uh, God's called us to start a church. But preacher asked me to do two things. This is kind of weird because I remember the first time I talked to him, he said it was your life verse. And so I kind of started to get my mind geared in that direction. And then he texted me and said, your life's calling. And uh, really the message I have that goes with my church plant, uh, the, the, the ministry that we're going to be doing down in Florida, um, this, this has to do a lot with my life's callings. But I want you to take your Bible, if you would, go to Deuteronomy very quickly in chapter number 10. And just want to just spend a minute on my, on my life's verse. And then I want to jump into the message that I have for you tonight. Deuteronomy chapter number 10. And this is a verse the Lord gave me over 20 years ago. I think if I remember correctly, and you know, all the, like the Psalms, they all have a setting, and everything in the Bible, you know, has a, has a historical context and a setting, and a lot of times you can understand the Psalms better when you understand the setting of what David was going through or something like that. The time that God gave me this verse really is my life's verse. I was at a liberal Bible college in Wisconsin. When I say liberal, I mean not technically theologically liberal, but they were like moving away from the King James Bible, and so they wouldn't have been orthodox on the, on the preservation of scriptures. They're moving away from standards and moving away from the local church position. They're trying to teach uh, hyper-Calvinism. And uh, so I was in a battle with professors that were much more learned than me, had a lot more years of study. And, uh, but I remember staying up all night sometimes trying to find out why they had to be wrong and there are no mistakes in my King James Bible. And that's what started me really on that quest of studying out that issue. Uh, but in the midst of all of that, uh, you know, they thought I was radical. But God gave me this verse, and it's Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse number 20. And it simply says this, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave and swear by his name. 
And, uh, you know, when I was going through that, that difficult time, and honestly, when I stepped into evangelism, it was probably like the greatest time ever to do it in the greatest context because I started to talk to these, these King James pastors, and they're finding out I'm fighting for the King James and being attacked for it like they gave me like a pity revival. Amen? Well, you can come preach for us, brother. We, we, we've got confidence in you. And I mean, I scheduled like 20 meetings back to back because guys knew I was in uh, this kind of battle. But I, I settled it way back yonder. I didn't have to worry about what men thought. I didn't have to worry about what the scholars thought. All I had to do was fear the Lord, serve Him, cleave to Him, and swear by His name. Amen? And that's all I needed to do is be faithful to Jesus. And uh, this has really been something that has guided my life. So many times I always write this down whenever I sign somebody's Bible. I was teasing the other week at a church. They wanted me to preach a message and play it in their service because they were doing like a a live stream deal, you know, they didn't have church, and, and so I did that, and I told them afterwards, you know, I, I preached the message, nobody was in the auditorium, just to be authentic, I went and knelt down at the altar for 20 seconds, and acted like I was getting right with God, amen, and then I, you know, waited there in line for a few seconds, and even signed my own Bible at the end, amen, but uh, no, whenever I was, uh, I like to have fun, don't you, amen, isn't it great to have the joy of the Lord, amen, just be able to enjoy church, and uh, I love church, amen. I don't know what I'd do if God didn't call me to be full-time in church. I just love a, I love the smell of an old Baptist church pew, amen. I, I love the smell of an old musty hymn book. I just like being around uh, Baptist people and, and uh, just, just being in church. It's wonderful. But, uh, so that's my life verse. But I, what I want you to do tonight is take your Bible and go to Mark chapter 16 with me. And I think you'll see this verse exemplified uh, in the path that God led me on. Take your Bible, go to Mark chapter 16 with me. What I'd like to do tonight is do something a little bit unusual. I want to tell you the story of how God led us to start a church, but in the midst of this, there's some lessons that I had to relearn and some things that I had to initially learn, just, just, just some things that God taught me. And uh, although these happen in the midst of what God showed us, there's some principles in here that you're going to go through things like this also, and God leads in certain distinct ways, and maybe you could glean something from this tonight. But I want to start kind of in the beginning of where God uh, first called me out into the ministry. Mark chapter 16 and verse number 15, the Bible says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you for the opportunity to just be with these good people. Thank you for the Campbells, Lord, and their faithfulness here. Lord, we know there's been opposition, there's been attacks on their home, attacks on the church, attacks on their children, and attacks on the good people here. And Father, uh, Lord, they've weathered all of it by your grace. And God, you've done so much here. I pray, God, you continue to use this local church body to go forward and serve you in these dark days. God, I pray they'd reap a great reward and you'd get great glory under yourself, Father, by using their lives Father, thank you for the opportunity and privilege I have to be here. I would rather be here than anywhere else in the world tonight in the perfect will of God. Uh, Father, in this city church, Father, just being able to preach the good word of God. We love you tonight, Lord Jesus. Bless us and help us. And God, as we think tonight even about our country, oh God, would you send revival. Father, would you break hearts tonight? Would you help people to lay down their weapons, Father, and get on their knees before a holy God? Lord, please, heal wounds and help our country, Father. It just seems like for the last year it's just been in nothing but turmoil and strife. And, oh, God, I don't know how long we can go on this way. God, please send help, I pray. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. This verse of Scripture that talks about preaching the gospel to every creature, or this was really my life calling. When the Lord called me to preach in 1996, way back in 1996, I finally surrendered. It was off at Bible College, and I was a youth pastor there. I surrendered to preach in early 1994. I'd been running from God, and I'd been saved in basic training back in 1987. God called me to preach. I was never discipled, kind of fell through the cracks and ran from the Lord. But in 1994 to 1996, I was a youth pastor in the state of Wisconsin. And when God called me out into evangelism, this was the verse that he used, and I'll never forget, and most of the major decisions I've made in my life, I'd have to just say this, and maybe this will help you as well. Most of the major decisions I've made, I've made sitting on a church pew 
with the Word of God just coming forth and dealing with my heart and then going to an old-fashioned altar and just weeping and making a decision before the Lord. And most of the major times God's turned me or just shown me something He wanted me to do. All of that from, you know, who to marry is my wife and, and call me out into full-time evangelism. Just most of the major decisions I've made under the preaching of the Word of God. But I distinctly remember God showed me this verse. And I remember at that time, my mentality was this. If I'm going to go out and preach a gospel to every creature, then I'm going to give God everything lock, stock, and barrel. As I mentioned, uh, I just recently was witnessing to some fellows and sadly had to tell them. I went to 55 Grateful Dead shows. I went to all different other kinds of hippie concerts and lived in 100,000 screaming people, living in a Volkswagen bus and in the back of a pickup truck and in a ditch or in a flop house or wherever it was, selling drugs and tie-dyed t-shirts just to try to make it to another show. And uh, But I remember, I, I live lock, stock, and barrel for the devil. And I just believe that when God saved me by His wonderful grace, there's no reason He ever should have saved a filthy dirt ball like me. I just believe that when you serve God, you ought to serve Him lock, stock, and barrel. Amen? If you've lived for the devil, and I know a lot of you in here have a similar testimony or one like my testimony. By the way, I don't care who you are, man. Your sin stunk, amen, just like mine did before you got saved. But wouldn't it be wise for us just to give Jesus everything, amen? Well, that's how I felt. If you look in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, this was my intention to serve God with everything that I had. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 19, watch what your Bible says here. In verse number 19, the Bible reminds us, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God. Now watch this. Ye are not your own. Look, friend, you say, well, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Have you checked with God about that, amen? Because we don't even own ourselves. He bought us, and the Bible said, for your bought, but not just bought with filthy lucre, with a price. That price was the precious blood, the perfect blood of the darling Lord Jesus. And he says, therefore, because you don't own yourself, God owns you. Because you've been bought by the blood, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And so I always believe that when God bought you, he owns you, and you ought to give everything to the Lord. Well, here was my problem in 1996. Maybe you can relate to this. How do you become an evangelist? How do you go out on the road and do and get meetings and preach and all those things that God was called me to do? I kind of had a comfort zone there working with the youth, and I had a nice job, and everything seemed to be going along fine till God came and disrupted my heart and mind about being an evangelist to America. And so I remember meeting with a guy named John Getch. He happened to graduate from the same school that I did many years prior to that. And I remember sitting down with him. He happened to be a preacher at a camp that I was counseling at back in 1996, and I sat down with him, and I began to ask him some questions. And I'll never forget the wisdom that he gave me, things I've given to others over the years. And I really appreciate some of the things he said. One of the things he said was this. He said, if you feel as though you're called to evangelism, he said, you need to find out through prayer and fasting. And Because my question was, well, how do you get started? And here's what he said to me. Because if God has called you, he said, you don't have to worry about trying to start it. He said, you won't be able to stop it if it's really of God. Amen. And I'll be honest with you, over the past 24 years, I've seen a lot of men get into evangelism, fizzle out of evangelism. I think a lot of them think, well, this would be cool to travel. And after about two years of living in dilapidated print shop rooms with cobwebs and freezing and all different kinds of things and breaking down everywhere and staying in every dilapidated hotel all of a sudden. By the way, our wishes ain't going to make it. If it's not a calling of God, I don't care what area of life it's in, you are not going to stay faithful to it unless the Holy Spirit is there helping you and you got to make sure you're called of God. But he told me that and I said, well, praise God, I'm going to do that. And eventually we did. We spent time in fasting and prayer and God convinced us that that was what he wanted us to do. But I also asked him this. I said, well, what am I supposed to do? Travel around in a car, stay in people's houses. Well, that didn't work much for us because we actually believed in biblical discipline. Amen. And it's kind of hard to rear your children. And there's modesty issues when you stay with people in their homes all the time. We found out that wasn't going to work for us. We found that out real quick if we wanted to have our family in order and raise a family for the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, which by God's grace we've been able to do to this point. We need to have our own place. And so he said this to me, though. He said, where your treasure is, 
there will your heart be also. Now, I don't know how you take that, but I took it this way. That means if I'm going to be on the road and that's where my heart is, then I need to take all my stuff with me. We decided that we'd move out into a camper. And all this sounds great and everybody's shaking their head, amen. It's real easy for me to make this decision. Then I had to go tell mama this, amen. I'm not talking about my mother. I'm talking about my wife, amen. Hey, honey, uh, we're going to move out on the road and sell all this junk. Wait a minute. You mean all the stuff we just uh, bought, we just got from our wedding? You mean the stuff still in the boxes? I mean, we had just been married when all this stuff happened. I never forget it. My wife just bought a nice country sofa. Uh, you know, that was back when country sofas were cool, man, in the early 90s. And, but we could just set up shop, and most of the gifts were still in boxes. And she said, what are we going to do? I said, well, we're going to sell all this stuff. We're going to give the rest away. We're going to leave the rest sit in this apartment or throw it in the dumpster. And we're going to move into a camper and go across America preaching. And uh, praise God, God dealt with her heart. She hit an altar one day and settled it, and that was the end of it. We did just that. We sold everything that we owned. A lot of stuff was still in the boxes. We reduced it, had another extended sale, threw the rest in the dumpster, moved out into a camper. Now, you can say hoorah right there. But I had no idea what I was doing. Can I just tell you that? I was so green, it was ridiculous. I'll never forget that 24-foot wilderness Yukon that we bought for the ministry. Uh, I don't know if it was a 1984 or something like that. And I bought this little camper, 24-footer. And I didn't know about, you know, being winter uh, ready and, and having, you know, polar package and all these things. They tell you that you're supposed to need for the winter. And I'll never forget when the wind started blowing in the fall. It got about November. Well, you knew the wind was blowing outside because you could feel it blowing in the living room. Amen. And uh, I remember the first time it snowed. There was little pockets of snow in the corners of that little travel trailer. I remember the first time we broke down with like 63 bucks in our pocket. The engine we think is blown. We're on the side of the road. Now I'm literally looking up into heaven saying, God, I thought if I gave everything to you, uh, you're going to take care of everything. And I mean, I had some doubts and my faith wavered. Uh, God had to pull us through some serious knot holes, amen, for a lot of years to bring us to the place where we are today. But my philosophy of the evangelist, though, was a little bit different than some guys. And I won't fall out with you if you have a little bit different viewpoint, but I believe that Philip, of course, the Bible calls him an evangelist. Nobody would argue that Philip wasn't an evangelist, but I have to believe the Apostle Paul, although he was in the office of an apostle, he also acted in the office of an evangelist. He, he was one that went and proclaimed the gospel and started New Testament churches, but as I look at these two men, take your Bible, for example, go to Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter number 8. And uh, I looked at Philip as a man who was a little bit different than Paul. For example, Paul, you see him almost exclusively starting churches, organizing churches, placing pastors in place, and, and going back and edifying churches and things of that nature. But then you see Philip in a little bit different light. Now, admittedly, the Bible doesn't give us much information about Philip, but we do know that he was there helping in the midst of a revival, preaching, discipling, counseling, talking to people. Then we see him caught away just to win one person to Jesus Christ. Nobody on this earth can argue that wasn't of God. God called him out into a desert to see one man, give him the gospel, see that man saved, and then the Bible says he's caught away from there by the Spirit of God. So that was what God had for him at that time. Then in Acts chapter 8, verse number 40, if you'll notice the Bible said, But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Seems to me like he wasn't there to stay a while, to establish a church, to gather people. But he preached maybe where others had preached. He preached maybe where there had been no one to preach before. But his ministry, I feel like, was a little bit different than the Apostle Paul's. Take your Bible, go to 1 Corinthians and chapter number 12. And they said, do you have any Bible to back this up, this different uh, way that men uh, do, do evangelism? Well, uh, and I'll just say this, I've known some men, and they've spent their entire life in federal penitentiaries witnessing to people, holding revivals in jails, and uh, I would never say that they're not God's men called of God. I believe that God has burdened them, 
gifted them, given them a niche. I know men that are evangelists and will spend most of their life running a youth camp, preaching through the summers, working on the buildings in the winters, presenting the ministry for support. I'm saying that uh, not everybody with the same calling does it the same exact way. That's a hard hurdle for some of us not heads to get over. Amen. We think everybody's supposed to do it the right way. And of course, the right way is always my way. Amen. I remember years ago, we get so dogmatic about stuff we hear people say but don't see in the Bible. Heard a preacher say, I believe one man is for one ministry for one lifetime, and that's all I believe. And, and that sounds real cool when you're young, and then God moves you. Amen. Now, how do you deal with that? I mean, you know what the Lord is showing you, and uh, that's easy for God to say that's pastored 50 years in the same place. Amen. But notice in the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and look at verse number 4 with me. The Bible said, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. So God hadn't gifted us or called us all to do the same thing, amen? But the same Spirit of God has got something for you, has got something for me, has got something for everybody. Thank God for that. Verse number 5, and there are differences in administrations, but the same Lord. So that's two people with the same gifting possibly, but administrations, that literally means the way you administer it or minister what it is that God has gifted you with and given you. But there are diversity, and there are diversities of operations. But it is the same God which worketh all in all, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Now, I've had to find this out. It's not my job to stand up on the pedestal of pride and try to judge what everybody else is doing. It takes all my time and all my wife's time just to try to keep me straight. Amen. I don't have time to worry about what everybody else is doing. Amen. So my point is this. I felt like God called me to be an evangelist to America, holding revivals, helping church planners, traveling to mission fields is just to be a help and an encouragement, uh, knocking on doors, preaching on the streets, and those type of things. And, and so that's exactly what I did, what I felt God called me to do. And we traveled, and then about 15 years ago, the Baptist history door just flung open. I could spend a lot of time on that, but eventually God moved us to St. Louis to be with Brother Beller, and really the Baptist history exploded. But let me try to tie it into the church plant now. Every time I went and did a Baptist history conference, and it was in well over 100 churches, probably about 200 churches, where I did a full week or a Sunday through Wednesday on Baptist history, every single time I did the basic Baptist history conference, one night of the week you were going to get a session, and it was going to be called the greatest revival in America's history, the Sandy Creek Church Planning Revival, where I taught on Shubal Stearns and showed the slides of how Stearns was saved and baptized and became a Baptist minister, then started a church in Sandy Creek, North Carolina, which turned around and started dozens of other churches, and those churches turned around and started dozens of other churches, and before you knew it, there were five to 10,000 churches all across the South that all could trace their roots back to the Sandy Creek Baptist Church. And I I made statements like this, and I believe that the hope for America, and by the way, I still believe this with every stitch of my being, I believe the hope for America today is the brand new independent Baptist King James only storefront church, amen. I believe it could use 100,000 new churches in the cities of America, and it would change this nation overnight. I believe that with all of my heart, but as I begin to say those things, I'd see pastors come forward in a service and they would get down on the altar. They'd be weeping sometimes saying, God, our church has been here 64 years. Would you let us reproduce ourselves in one church? I've had men get up with trembling lip and saying, we're guilty. We've been here over 100 years and we have this church hasn't birthed a church since it was started way back, you know, how many years ago. But many times what those men didn't know was Ted Alexander was on this side of the altar saying, oh, God, would you let me be a part of the answer? God, would you let me be a part of what you're doing and what the answer, the hope for America is? But oftentimes, believe it or not, God said no. You say, really? You know, there are times Paul wanted to preach in a certain place, and I believe with all my heart he was going to preach faithfully, declare clearly the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
but the Holy Spirit forbade him. I can't explain it, but I knew that through the leadership of my pastor, I'd get some understanding. I'd go to Brother Beller and say, Preacher, I want to go start churches. And Brother Beller would say, You know, Brother Alexander, I just feel like right now, if you're not out there saying what you're saying about church planning, who's going to be saying it? We need you out there doing what you're doing. I'd say, Okay, Preacher, I guess that's good enough. And I'd continue to do what I was doing. But the burden never went away. Amen? And right now I realize, though, that I was waiting. I was in a process. And some point in that process, God said, all right, you can plant a church, but just be faithful and wait on me. Just wait on me. Now here's what I want to try to throw out a warning, if I may. As you wait on God, you may be at a point in your life right now, say, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not gaining any ground. I know I need to be doing something more. I'm not sure what the next steps are. And maybe God just has you in a holding pattern. Be very careful in that holding pattern. Let me tell you the negative first. Then let me tell you the positive. The negative is this. The devil knows when you're in a holding pattern. It's funny when you don't know how to run a PC. You're all Mac. Amen. But I'm trying to click to get the thing going here. Amen. The devil's going to put some shiny objects in front of you to try to get you out of God's will. Sometimes God just wants you to wait. That's hard for hard-headed people like us just to be faithful in what we're doing and wait for that time. But I promise you, so a church opens up in Pennsylvania. Now, this ain't going to mean hardly anything to you, amen? But say it well, you're from Indiana. Say it was in, in a nice little cove in Indiana, amen? But I'm talking about Roaring Spring, Pennsylvania, literally dozens of springs gushing out of the mountainsides. White-tailed deer bouncing all over. No one knows it's there's the Lord, amen, and just a few dumb Baptists, amen. But anyway, they, they called me right away, say, hey, we need a preacher. And I thought, man, Lord, I'd go there, man, we could have a nice little house. Haven't had a house with a roof on top in over 20 years. And I thought, man, we could kill some white-tailed deer and just pastor a nice little flock there and bring them to perfection in Jesus and just serve the Lord. God said, no, not for you. But, Lord, I love them little mountains of Pennsylvania. Church in Canada calls me. I'm in a waiting pattern, and the devil's trying to get me. And I'm going to tell you what, just doing something for God is not the goal. Doing the perfect will of God is always the goal because the devil always has a second best and a third best and another plan that you may think looks more lucrative. i give you an example. I had a church, and I won't tell you where it was at, but... Nonetheless, they contacted me and told me they were going to buy me with the equivalent of a $350,000 home to move. There's their pastor. They're going to buy me a brand new church van to run for myself. They're going to buy me a new cell phone. And I mean, buddy, and I don't know why this is, by the way, preacher, but every time there's money involved, God always says no to me. Amen. I don't know if it's just because I wouldn't know how to handle it or what. But, uh, but literally, they offered me that to come be their pastor with the same doctrine. I've known the people for years. God said no. I had a church call me from Lubbock, Texas, where E.O. Bynum used to pastor. The pastor at the time down there, Brother Sargent, contacted me. And after I told him a hundred times God wasn't in it, he convinced me to come down and just hold the pulpit for a Sunday while we're down there. Hey, go look at some houses while you're here and that kind of thing. New development, new homes. I mean, honestly, the doctrine was the same. I sat down, talked to the people. They liked us. We were compatible. And God said no. Before we ever even left to go there. What are you trying to say? Be very careful when you're in a holding pattern. When God is ready for you to go forward. And you say, well, that's not a big deal. I'm going to say this is a big deal on following God the rest of your life. Amen. You better not straggle behind. But one of the dangers all of us have is we're too gung-ho and we run way out ahead of God. Amen. Look in your Bible to 2 Samuel. Now there's a passage here. And you know what's interesting? is the Lord begin to show me this after the fact. This is what I was doing, Ted. You've preached this, but you can't hardly see it yourself. Amen? Maybe I'm the only preacher that's like that. Amen? I can tell you exactly what the problem is, but I can't see my hand in front of my face sometimes. Amen? I'm glad the Lord's patient, aren't you? Second Samuel 5, God began to show me some things. Verse number 17, but when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it and went down to the hold. And the Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephium. David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up? 
to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into mine hand? He prayed now, and the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. David came to Baal Perazim, and David smote them there, and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of the place Baal Perazim. There they left their images, and David and his men burned them. And the Philistines came up yet again, spread themselves in the valley of Rephium. Everybody look up here. Now let me get this straight. David was there in, in, in great turmoil. He's being surrounded. He goes to God and says, Lord, should I go up? God says, yep, you go up. God takes care of the problem. The Bible said he broke forth. I love just seeing the power of God on that day. I'm not sure all that means, but I can just imagine. They go in and they take all the spoil and took everything these people have. God greatly blesses them. Now listen, not long after that, the same enemy comes up. They've regrouped. They've sharpened their swords. They're coming after the same people, same David, same God. Now am I thinking, well, I've already asked God once. Amen. I already prayed last month. Why pray today, right? Isn't that how we are? I prayed over my meals. Why do I got to pray all the time? But I'm going to tell you what, David, if it had been me, I'd have probably just ran out to battle, got my tail kicked. But you know what David did? He said, nope, I'm going to inquire of the Lord again. Buddy, we better bathe every step we take in prayer and make sure God's in it. Notice verse 23. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, thou shalt not go up. You say, he told him, no. No, he didn't. Watch this. But fetch a compass behind them and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. Now, we often say this, and here's the text proof for it. We say, when you pray, sometimes God says no. Amen? I know it's hard for us to accept. Some of us don't like that word no. Amen? I think a lot of times God says no to me. But sometimes we pray Thank God God says yes. Amen? But did you know that sometimes God says, just wait? It's not yes, it's not no, but just wait. Notice the next verse. He said, go over against the mulberry trees, and let it be, verse 24, when thou hearest the sound of the going. He said, I want you to go, but not just yet. When thou hear the sound of the going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then... Thou shalt bestir thyself, for then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. Here's what God said. You can go up now, but I'm not going to go with you. But if you'll just be patient, go wait under the mulberry trees. And when you hear the sound of the going in the mulberry trees, he said, then bestir yourself. Now, I love this. Amen. I get excited about this. He said, don't go yet. But when I tell you to go, buddy, you better stir yourself up for everything you've got. You better muster up every ounce of the Holy Ghost in you. And then the Lord's going to go with you. And God's going to do something great. You read the story. That's exactly what happened. This is the text God brought to my mind after the fact. Now, let me try to bring you up to snuff. This past spring. I finished conducting a, a tour in the state of Missouri and got deathly sick. I've been all over Africa and all over Europe. I've been in about 12 countries or something like that, and I thought I had yellow fever from everything I could tell. Then I was reading it. I, I got to the hospital in Columbia, Missouri, at the University of Missouri. They thought I had spinal meningitis. They were very uh, worried and concerned when I got in there. They began to test me. You know, did you ever have this happen? You go to a doctor, when you leave, you got a list. It's about a mile long, and they've charged you $8,000 to tell you 47 things you don't have. Amen? Thank you, sir. Uh, Captain Obvious. Never found out what I had. But on that bed in that hospital, I made peace with God. I literally thought I was going to die. I have this noise in my brain going, voo, 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 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I couldn't lift my head up. I lost all my strength. I literally thought I was going to die. I got out of there, and just perchance, Brother Aaron Rogerson, I was in his church preaching a meeting on the blood of Jesus. I preached Sunday morning. He actually took my PowerPoint preached the rest of the meeting. Somewhere that week, he asked me, Preacher, is there anything you can think of? He said, and he mentioned my teeth. And I said, well, you know, brother, I had an infected tooth. He said, well, did you ever deal with it? I said, no, actually, I was too busy to deal with it. And I know that sounds terrible, but I was literally so pressed in ministry. I got back from Europe into Chicago at midnight, got in a car, 
drove all night to Detroit to preach. That's my schedule sometimes. It's just, I, and I'm killing myself. And I went into the doctor. She said, you've got a serious problem. Hook me up the next day with an oral surgeon. They went and took that tooth out. Apparently, the infection went up into my brain. And for six weeks, I was down. It took like five days for the antibiotics to start turning me around again. I was literally just laid out, crawled to the bathroom and back a couple times a day, and that was basically it. During that time, I spent a lot of seasons in prayer, and finally the Lord said, Ted, something's going to change in your ministry. Just get ready. I still didn't know I was going to start a church, but I called my preacher and said, Brother Burke, I said, we've got to meet. I'm killing myself with my schedule. I'm going to have to start flying or back off on some of my meetings, spend more time at the church, do something, because I just, I'm killing myself out here, and I realize the Lord's telling me, you're beating your body up too bad. I'm only 50, but I'm going to tell you what, I spent thousands of sleepless nights. I mean, nights just driving through the night to meetings, finish on a Friday night, drive all night Friday, all day Saturday, go all day Sunday, be, not be fit for shooting on Monday. I'm not complaining. I'm just telling you, that's been my schedule. And I told my preacher, I got to back off. And so he talked to me and said, yeah, we need to have a meeting when you get home. Well, I thought for sure when I sat down with him, six weeks later, I was finally able to drive and see straight. I drove my bus back to our home church. And I thought Brother Burke's going to sit down and say what he said a few years before that, which was this. Why don't you come on staff and uh, you can, you know, work around the church here, do some of our shut-in visits, nursing home services for, things like that, preach here and there. He said, and you can just, you know, preach out when you can, fly and, and preach local and stuff like that. But when I sat down with him, he said, I literally thought that's what he was going to ask me because he asked me to pray about that a few years before that, and I didn't have peace about it. But he said, are you sitting down? I said, yeah, we're sitting in a skyline, by the way. Can I at least get an amen right there? I haven't had too many tonight, amen? It's always positive when you're sitting in skyline, amen? And he said, uh, he said uh, are you holding on tight? And I was like, uh-oh, what's he going to say? He said, because I do a Baptist temple, wants your family to start a church in Homestead, Florida. And I was like, what? He's like, crazy, huh? And I was like, yeah, where's Homestead, Florida? And he begins to tell me. And when he's telling me it's south of Miami, it's 20 minutes north of the Keys, it's not far from Key Biscayne Wildlife, uh, National Wildlife Refuge on the shore, 15 minutes to the east, I'm thinking, wow, it must be like some kind of paradise, probably like what you're thinking right now, amen? And I picked up my cell phone and started looking at it, and it starts showing up on all the high crime lists. He's just sitting there not saying anything, amen? <laughs> Give me the dumb look. And all of a sudden, I read Florida City, which is like a... It's like a mole on the neck of Homestead. It's, uh, they consider it the armpit of Florida. And what it is is it's over 50% Spanish-speaking, uh, transients, people that have come in from Cuba, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Venezuela, Mexico, and uh, they basically steal to live. And it, it, uh, you'll see the chart here in a minute, the crime, uh, high crime. is just double Florida. It's double national and all that. But uh, as I began to look at that, I said, oh, you're trying to kill me off, amen. <laughs> and uh, he said, no, there's a great need down there for a church. He said, would you pray about it? I said, I would definitely pray about it, preacher. And I, by the way, I believe in following the man of God. I'll just be honest with you, I preached that for years. I don't believe men of God are perfect. My pastor said, walk off a cliff. I mean, that's totally different. But I want to say, take your Bible. In fact, go to Hebrews 13. Let me just try to help you with something, folks. I believe God leads through your pastor many times. And I think that we there's there's too many bad guys out there that lord it over people that we're, we're shy and timid about really following the leadership of pastors many times. And it's a sad state of affairs. We can't let a couple bad apples and guys that have abused their authority uh, to turn us, you know, a, away from submitting to our pastors. Look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you. Now, it defines who that is, who have spoken unto you the word of God. That's your preacher, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. So how did all this come together? So my pastor says, well, you remember Jeff Allen? You might know the guy. He designed this flag right here. He was a member of our church for 13 years, 15 years. His wife's a Christian school teacher in our school for 15, 13 years. They moved down there for a really good job. There was a decent church when they got there. It fell through. They've been in a couple others, but really nothing that you and I would really feel comfortable being a member of without getting into bashing, you know, their doctrine and things of that nature. But there's Calvinism and bad music and all that kind of stuff. But uh, he said, you know, Brother Jeff's been contacting me still. 
they're praying for a church down there, and you're contacting me, telling me what's going on with you, that you need to back off from the road. And God just said to me one day after I prayed for him and prayed for you, well, there's the tool that you need to just go do the job. He's your local church evangelist. And I said, wow. Now, I'm going to just be honest with you. If that would have come from a lot of people, I'd have been like, uh, yeah, right. But my man of God has been faithful. He has just, I mean, loved God. He's not always over here, then over there. He's just walked a straight line and followed the Lord Jesus. And the Bible says, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Then look at in verse number 17. Obey them that have the rule over you. Say, yeah, but you're a minister yourself. Yeah, but I have a pastor. I'm a local church evangelist under uh, uh, the tutelage and leadership of my local church pastor. He says, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Not to get into parsing these verses, we could really spend a lot of time on them. He said, would you just pray about it? I said, preacher, absolutely. If it's coming from you, yes, sir. And all of a sudden, I thought I was going to get red light like Pennsylvania. Nope, green light. Pray a little more. It's going to be a red light like Canada. Nope, green light. It's going to be a red light like Texas. Nope, green light. And so what did you do? By the way, let me just throw this out at your Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. He shall direct thy paths. You know, that's cool to quote. It's great to believe, but it's awesome to see God do it in your life. Amen. He is directing our paths because we've trusted him. We, where else can we go? What else are we going to do? I mean, I don't have the wisdom. I guarantee you that. So what did you do, preacher? Well, we took a survey trip to Florida in October. Now, it's just us here tonight. Let me tell you why I did a survey trip. Because independent Baptist pastors are going to say, did you take a survey trip to the field that God has called you to? Amen. I hate that that's online, but it's the truth. And you independent Baptists need to get this right. Amen. But uh, so, but you know what was great? I already knew God wanted me in Florida. And so I was able to get on the plane, just go down there, look around, pray, travel around, orient myself with the area and enjoy it. Because honestly, I mean, what, what was I going to do? Let that to be the determining factor? Oh, man, it, it, it's horrible down here. I can't come here. What was I going to do do that? Oh, man, look, it's really great. It's a wonderful neighborhood, and everybody wants to get saved. Would I want to go then? That's crazy. So I prayed, and God said go. And so I was able to go just go down there and say, this is where God wants us to be. So what we decided to do was to try to do an 18-month deputation. Now, our church is not new at this. We have a church planning missionary in Gunnison, Colorado. I don't know if you folks know Brother Byron, Brian Roberts. He was Brother Thornsley's cohort out there. They're good friends when they're out there together and such. Uh, Brother Roberts has been out there about five or six years. And I watched him, and I love Brother Roberts, but he went off gun-ho, and he didn't have a whole lot of support, and he struggled, has had, had to work 50 or more hours a week every, every week. And it's just difficult to start a church that way. It really is. Uh, we have a guy in Mexico, same thing. We have a guy, uh, another guy in Ohio that has started a church and other churches. But um, so I determined, I really prayed about it, and the Lord said, uh, I don't want an open-ended uh, deputation. You ever have these guys come through, well, how long are you going to be on deputation? I don't know, we're in year number four. Then about year five, well, God didn't really, you know, we're not going to go now, you know. <laughs> so we determined 18 months we would try to get our house in order, sell our bus, which we still haven't done yet, or pay it off, one of the two, amen and uh, try to back out of some of the meetings because I literally had a full calendar of all kinds of different meetings and such. But immediately we cut that down to 17 months, and right now we cut it back about another month. So what we're going to be doing is moving down there in February. Uh, we'll pack up everything we have, move down there in February. We're going to have March to be able to saturate the whole area. And then uh, on uh, Easter, Resurrection Sunday, uh, I believe it's April 4th, we'll be starting our first service down there. That'll be our big push and the big, the big uh, deal down there. Um, let me tell you just real quick, and I know this is highly unorthodox. Why am I trying to raise support? Let me give you an example. Um, South Florida is extremely expensive. I don't know what it is around here, but for a three-bedroom apartment in a safe area where you're not going to have to dodge bullets, um, you know, and your stuff's actually going to be there when you get back each day, a three-bedroom apartment is going to cost us about $1,800 a month. Um, the reason is because it's close enough to the Keys and it's a bedroom community for Miami, even though it's a high crime area. It gets them out of the city. Um, and so basically you have two classes down there. The people that own all the tourism and the buildings and stuff. And then the people floating across, literally, that are sneaking in. And you have a slim middle class of a little bit of military 
and some other middle class folks that have decent jobs and are character and such. And so it is what it is. The problem is, as I was looking at jobs, you know, because obviously if you have to work a job, you have to work a job. You got to do God's called you there. So I've been looking at different jobs and take like, for example, a forklift operator. I've looked at several jobs I used to do. Um, they'll start you down there uh, less than what I made in 1990 uh, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, driving a forklift. So although the rent and everything expense are through the roof, the pay is just pitiful. Um, so I, I'm trying to raise some support, and uh, God has blessed us. We're at about fi at least 50% of what we would need to live down there right now. So we started in October. That's really fast, amen. We were just cruising along like five out of six churches in Arkansas took us on, you know. Then this corona balona hit, amen, if I can call it that. And uh, it just shut everything down. And so now we're just trying to get back into it. So I was just blessed even to be able to come here. But uh, what's happened since then? Okay, so this fellow, Brother Jeff, down there, uh, let me try to pull a couple things up. Brother Jeff, uh, the guy out of our church that is down there now, um, he's at work one day, and uh, he a guy pulls in to deliver flowers, and the fella is listening to preaching. And Brother Jeff said, hey, what's that? And he said, of course, you know, I'm listening to preaching. And he said, uh, what's the deal? Well, come to find out this fella joined the military, fell out of church, and uh, there it is, fell out of church, and he's from a holler in Kentucky. Is that anything major? Oh. Okay, we'll just ignore that. Amen? We're, we're just, we're going we're gonna to find a place to land this plane here in a second. So Brother Jeff, uh, Talks to him and everything and find out he's from an old missionary Baptist church in Kentucky. Joined the military, got out of church. Now, let me tell you how great this is. And you, this is a glory to God. His wife was out of church, obviously. His children were lost, two little boys, a 10 and a 6-year-old, and uh, Tanner and Raylan. And uh, Brother Jeff says, well, you know, what are you doing listening to preaching? He said, well, I still listen to preaching once in a while. He said, why don't you join the church? He said, I can't find a good church down here. I had just been there. Brother Jeff said, wow. He said, Ted Alexander's coming down here to start a church. He said, why don't you come over Sunday morning? We'll start doing Bible studies together. And he said, yeah, I'd like to do that. They got Robert Sargent's materials, ABC's of Christian Growth, and started going through lessons. Three weeks in, the wife looks up and says, you know what? I need to be baptized. Then the man looks up and says, you know what? Also, I need we need to start tithing. And uh, before I know it, they're calling me and saying, hey, you got your first new church members down here. I'm calling my preacher. I'm like, hey, preacher, what am I going to do? I'm not even going to be down there yet. It's happening too fast. He said, well, Jesus, uh, you know, John started a little group and handed them off to Jesus, and Paul would start a group and hand it off. And he said, that's just the way it works. I said, what am I going to do? He said, you're going to go down there and baptize her. Amen? And so this is <coughs> Angela Middleton, and that's a baptism in a, an Amazon swimming pool, amen, <laughs> on the backside of Jeff's house there. And, uh, oh, let me see here real quickly. Yeah, we got some pictures. There's the old dump ski. And then uh, just real quick. So this is basically our body right now. That's us there, our church family on the right there. We got the Allens, Brother Jeff and Sister Janet. And then we got the Middletons and their two boys. And then my wife and I, believe it or not, Joelle is going to be married in July, my third daughter. So I just got Luke, who actually weighs over 200 pounds now. It's crazy, amen. And it's, it's up and out, amen. But anyway. Uh, and then Emma, and Emma's already 18, and she's got a young man already knocking on her door. Amen. It's, it's crazy stuff. But <clears throat> so I, I was able to accept him in just by uh, letter or declaration because he had been in a missionary Baptist church. He had sound doctrine. He had a scriptural baptism. We accepted her in through baptism. So that was all great. So I go down and do all that. Spent about two weeks here. We had some service. I can show you some pictures of our service in the house and stuff. But then after that, uh, about three weeks later, I get a call. They started, when I went down, I started Wednesday nights. And so Jeff started just doing prayer time on Wednesday nights and giving a little devotion. Tanner raised his little hand on Wednesday night, man, come with tears in his eyes and got saved. Amen. So here's Brother Frank Middleton. He is as redneck as you ever met redneck. I'm telling you, buddy, he come from right around Hazard. Amen. And, uh, but he's just a great guy, loves God. He got into church. His wife got right, got into church. His son got saved, and his other son is, is getting closer to being saved. Amen. And so God has really been good to us. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do is show you the video. Uh, a lot I could say about this. We're going to try to stay close. The one, it's, it's interesting down there. You might have a black area. 
Then you got Venezuelan area. Then you got a Haitian, all people from Haiti. Some people down there are speaking French Creole. You got people from Dominican. Then you got your Spanish speaking people. And then you got white people. It's just, it's all different types of neighborhoods. US 1 divides Homestead. The whole western side is a lot of bad neighborhoods. Florida City, the whole thing's a bad neighborhood. It's about 20, 21,000. Um, and then there's going to be about 100,000 total that we'll be able to minister to. On the east side, it's a hodgepodge. But there's, a, there's an Air Force base there. Our plan is to try to stay at least somewhere close to the Air Force Base. We'd like to be able to get a church established because we know how expensive it is. It's going to be hard for us to get a building, a lot harder than it is here probably because they just don't want to let go of that stuff down there. But uh, God can do it. I mean, he can shut down the Campbellites and give us that. I mean, that'd be glorious. But um, there's a J, big JW place right down there by where we're going to be. We're going to try to get something going and then try to reach the more difficult-to-reach neighborhoods uh, that we wouldn't be able to live in just because of the, the gun violence and things of that nature. So... I'm going to go ahead and show you the video, Preacher. I'm not sure I know how to do this. Uh, oh, I just got to click on that up there. All right, will that make it big and, and start it? Oh, yeah, we have no sound, so there is, but okay, how do I do this? Yeah, you might want to. Just so you know, I just put a little bit of our display up over there. I didn't put the whole thing out for sake of room, and there's some prayer cards there. If you'd take one of those, please pray for us. I'd appreciate that. Jody and I have been married for 23 years. This is our original crew. The Lord has truly blessed us. In early 2019, God blessed us with the privilege of becoming grandparents. Our home church and sending church is the Cazadale Baptist Temple in Goshen, Ohio. Our pastor, Travis Berg. Our field is Homestead, Florida. Homestead is the gateway to the Keys and is on the south end of the 100 mile long metropolitan area which has as its center the city of Miami. In August of 1992, Homestead was devastated by Hurricane Andrew, a Category 5 hurricane that caused great destruction. The area has never fully recovered, therefore much of the housing is low income, government subsidized, trailer parks, and high crime areas. Many people choose to fence in their property and bar windows and even doors. As you can see by this chart, property crimes are rampant. Single parent homes and drugs are common in these neighborhoods. Poverty and crime are common, but there are several neighborhoods that are nicer. This is the Homestead City Hall. This is one of the nicer homes, and this is one of the nicer neighborhoods. There are even many gated communities. Homestead is not any different than anywhere else in America. Dead religion sadly abounds. The cults are everywhere, preaching the false gospel. But God has raised up a solid man to help us in the church plan, Brother Jeff Allen. Brother Jeff is a song leader and a music man. God has already knit our hearts together. No one knows how badly Homestead needs a scriptural church better than Brother Jeff and Sister Janet. My pastor and I flew to Florida in October of 2019 and spent time there on a survey trip. Our plan is to find a place to meet near 
the Homestead Air Reserve Base. There are many character, upstanding, hardworking people in this area that simply do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray for us as we look around for a place to meet. Storefronts, meeting rooms, YMCA, community centers, whatever the Lord gives us, that's where we will start. To say that Homestead, Florida will be a big change for us is putting it mildly. The climate is often described as sweltering heat. The wildlife is different and can be dangerous. The animals and insects are exotic and unusual. The Everglades are the western border of Homestead. Pythons have overrun the Everglades. They have destroyed the ecosystem. The culture is a mixture that is hard to define and the people are diverse. There's a huge immigrant population. Homestead area is home to many Mexicans, Haitians, Cubans, Venezuelans, Dominicans, African Americans, Caucasians, is that God will raise up a Spanish-speaking translator for us. Brother Jeff is processing this and trying to work towards that goal. How to pray for us. Pray for our family to love God first. We need support and a quick departure. We need a Spanish-speaking couple to partner with us. We need God's hand and logistical issues and also a reasonably priced, safe place to live. Please pray also, most of all, for fruit from our evangelistic efforts. As New Testament believers, we've been given a commission. Hudson Taylor said the Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. Please pray and ask the Lord how you could partner with us to help us fulfill our call to Homestead, Florida that fruit may abound to your account.